Welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. Hi, I'm Bob from Crane Appliance. Since 1983, as a family-owned company, our goal has been simple, to give our neighbors to the Cape and Islands a great shopping experience. Rest easy knowing our professional team will listen to your needs and help you pick out the perfect appliances. We'll take care of everything throughout the sale, delivery, and installation process. And we even have our own in-house service department. Crane Appliance, we call the Cape and Islands home. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. 508-548-7303 or toll free at 1-800-696-7303. Our email address is carlsonprinting at aol.com. Carlson Printing, for all your printing needs. Hosting services for fctv.org are provided by Meganet Communications. Meganet offers a wide array of internet services, including Mega Backup Cloud Service, Server Colocation, T1, Fiber, Metro Ethernet, as well as telephone services such as hosted PBX and digital voice. Their number one goal is to keep your communications network up and running and allow you to focus on growing your business. 877-634-2638 or meganet.net.
I would like to open the session of the Falmouth Select Board. It is October 3rd at exactly 6.30 p.m. And we, I would like to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, firefighters union, mis minimum shift staffing, and I as chair declare that an open session may have a detrimental effect on such bargaining. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Brown, aye. Patterson, aye. Scott Price, aye. Taylor, Zosky. aye. Zosky, aye. And the board will return to open session at 7 o'clock. A couple of us went, attended an event where there's potential exposure, so we're wearing masks today just for yes. safety precaution. Yes. I just have to give her a signal. Okay, good evening. I would like to open the public session of the Falmouth Select Board. It is Monday, October 3rd, 2022. It is now 7 o'clock, and the board is returning from executive session where we discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. Falmouth Firefighters Union minimum shift staffing and the board was able to affirm a presented MOU with the firefighters union. I just need to announce that um, Mr. Johnson Staub contracted COVID and he gave me permission to say that and he will not be joining us this evening. So I would ask that you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, I would ask at this time that you please silence your cell phones and notify me as the chair if you're making any personal video or auto audio recording of this open session meeting. Thank you. Okay, any recognitions this evening? Anything coming to mind? Okay. Announcements? Madam Chair, I have a couple announcements. Please. I'd like to announce that Coffee with a Cop is back on Wednesday, October 5th from 9 to 11 a.m. at Peg Noonan Park. It's an opportunity for the public to have coffee and talk with some police officers. And also, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and there are uh, official Falmouth Police Pink patches available uh, for sale. Um, it's an innovative public awareness campaign designed to bring attention to the fight against breast cancer and to support breast cancer research organizations in combating this devastating disease. Feel free to drop by the Falmouth Police Station to purchase one of the items, such as a hat, t-shirt, or patch, and help support this worthy cause. Time's the coffee, about nine? Nine to 11. And that's all I have. Is that it? Your umbrella. It was raining last time. Any other <laughs> announcements? Okay, we'll move to public comment. Public comment may be made on routine matters, not on the agenda this evening. Comments are limited to two minutes. Please introduce yourself. Since the matter has not been included on the agenda, the select board may not participate in any discussion or debate of the topic. It is not appropriate to use the public comment period to comment on any person's reputation, character, physical condition, or mental health, disciplinary matters, or civil or criminal charges. Comments about job performance and decisions are permissible. Is there anyone here for public comment? Mr. Moriarty. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is David Moriarty, a uh, lifelong Falmouth Select resident. I'd just like to uh, inform everyone that the second wind turbine is going to be coming down October 5th between 9 and 11 a.m. And I, I do believe they're going to be closing the highway. Uh, secondly, there's been a five state proposal. You've all heard about the money, the uh, infrastructure money. Well, there's a five-state proposal, and they're looking for information from stakeholders. That's individuals, business owners, government agencies, 
on a uh, ocean wind cable that doesn't interfere with coastal towns. It goes directly to the cities. It avoids all the trouble we're having with the Mayflower <clears throat> Project. And they would like public comment. And uh, I'm going to leave this with the Board of Selectmen. Hopefully they can post it. Mr. Moriarty, please speak to the board. Could you uh, possibly post the... Uh, we'll, we'll take a look on at your, that. Oh, that'd be great. Because uh, it's very important that we have input here and to tell them exactly what our interests are and why it would not benefit us. Thank you. I'll just leave this with the chair, okay? Thank you, Mr. Moriarty. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Do we have any other people here for public comment? Okay, I will move on to the town manager's report. I will represent that for Mr. Johnson Staub. Just a couple of quick things. Um, we have a public hearing. Wagner Hospitality doing business at, as the Holiday Inn, applying for a transfer of ownership of an all alcoholic common Victor license. No change to the terms of the license and no staff concerns. We have a couple of reports. Resilient Woods Hole will be reporting out. Rob Munier, Vice President <clears throat> for Marine Facilities and Operations at Hui. He'll provide an overview of the Phase 3 report, which was funded by the Coastal Zone Management Grant. 55-page report can be reviewed at https colon backslash resilientwoodshole.org backslash news hyphen and hyphen events backslash number sign reports. We'll have an update on traffic improvement proposed for several intersections. Town engineer Jim McLaughlin and the consulting engineer will present the proposals for the intersection of Route 151 and Sam Turner Road and for the intersection of Worcester Court and Spring Bars Road. The board will have an opportunity to ask questions and provide any feedback on the preliminary designs. Town Council Attorney Moore O'Keefe will provide some information regarding our town manager hiring process and, and give the board some direction on that. The board will also be looking at recommendations for the November 2022 annual town meeting. And we will be voting recommendations on five articles. <clears throat> we have a consent agenda and staff have reviewed all items on the consent agenda and have raised no concerns. We have one set of minutes to be looked at and reviewed. Madam Chair. I do have yes. one item to add to the town manager's preliminary report. If I Please. Can. Thank you. Um, I also would like to report that um, there's ongoing litigation in the matter of Mastriani v. Uh, Falmouth ZBA. And last week, a judge in the Barnstable Superior Court heard a motion by plaintiffs for an, a preliminary injunction. This morning, that judge did grant the preliminary injunction. Um, the, the motion requested that the judge um, issue essentially a cease and desist order to cease all use of the pickleball courts at Lawrence Middle School. And so the judge did order that. I have yet to receive the actual decision on the preliminary injunction, but it will cause the town to shut those courts down. And do you have any idea how long a preliminary injunction lasts? It lasts during the pendency of litigation. So it doesn't stop litigation. It just, it's a marker in time. Uh, the town will continue to litigate that. Um, there is an amended complaint that added another count. Um, the case still has yet to be tried. There are still dispositive motions that will be heard and filed. So um, this is just one step along the journey. Great. Any questions on that from the board? So that's new to us? No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we'll move on to committee interviews. Interview, vote, and appoint committee member Conservation Commission Melissa Freitag. Right here. Thank, good evening, Board. I'm Melissa Freitag, Precinct 6, Falmouth, and I'm currently a member of the Conservation Commission. I guess there was a little mix-up the last time I was here and wasn't appointed as, appointed as a full committee member but, or commission member, but rather an alternate. And 
I've been being used as a full commission member. I enjoy being on the commission. I'm currently taking um, a course towards a, uh, a series of courses towards a certificate in um, through the Mass Association of Conservation Commissions. I'll uh, in about six weeks I'll have my fundamentals in conservation in Massachusetts certificate, and I look forward to serving the town further in full capacity on the commission. Great. Any questions from the board? Oh, there's only two references here. I'm sorry. No, only <laughs> Can I bring you in, fill you in as another one? <laughs> I removed parole and appointment. That's an ancient application you're looking at there. <laughs> I would move a, uh, an appointment to a term in 2025. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for a full member position. Correct, Mr. Brown? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just wanted to double check that. Uh, motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, might I just take a quick moment to push the reestablishment of the Coastal Resiliency Action Committee in the sense that tens of billions of dollars have been set aside at the federal government level for ocean and coastal resiliency, and we need a group to be writing for grants for our Thank town. You. So okay. consider Thank it. You. Okay, we're ahead of schedule a little bit, so I would like to, um, as I may, move things out of order, and I'd like to go through the consent agenda. If you have anything to hold on the consent agenda as I read through the items, please notify me. Licenses, approve, approve application to transfer of a common victory license, 10 Water Street, LLC, doing business as Pine in the Sky, 10 Water Street, Woodsboro. Approve application for special one-day all-alcohol liquor licenses, Falma Theater Guild, Highfield Theater, 58 Highfield Drive, October 21, 22, 23, 28, 29, 30, November 4, 5, 6, 2022, a total of nine days, Friday and Saturday, 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Sunday, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Approve application for a special one-day wine and malt liquor license shipwrecked Falmouth in the Fall Road. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Falmouth in the Fall Road Race after party shipwrecked Heights Hotel parking lot Sunday, November sixth, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Approve an application for a special one-day Walt wine and malt beverage license tapped wedding reception 16 Worcester Ave Falmouth. Saturday, October 15th, 2022, from 1 to 3 p.m. Approve request by All of Restaurants, Inc., doing business as Shivrick Cafe and Bar for extended hours of service for an all-alcoholic beverage license from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. Monday through Saturday and 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Sunday. Administrative orders approve request for a waiver of the special event permit fee for the Chris Weatherby Memorial Toy Run on Sunday, 11 6, 2022. And any questions? Okay. And approve grant of license to Sharon and Ronald Noons to maintain a wooden picket fence and landscaping elements located in the town right of way at 23 Oak Street. I move that we approve all the items under the consent agenda licenses A through E and administrative orders A and B. Second. Hey, so I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> and we will do one more thing. We will review and vote to approve the minutes of the meeting's public session June 21, 2021. Do we have any changes? Madam Chair, I did not find any after I read through them all. They seem to be accurate to the best of my recollections <laughs> since it was a 2021 meeting. So I move approval and release for public access. Okay. I think I had one issue, and my sure. one issue was on page 3 of 18. It says, um, blah, 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 to appoint Mr. Morse full voting position, second English Braga. And then it says, Mr. Patterson and Chair Taylor. I believe it should be Vice Chair Taylor, because right after that, it identifies Mr. Brown as the chair. <laughs> oh, good okay. catch. So if we could just change that with that one 
amendment. I would, um, we have a motion to approve? Yes, second. as amended. Okay, motion to approve as amended. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, we can start with our public hearing. Um, I would ask Ms. Scott Price to read the formal published notice. Notice is hereby given under Chapter 138 <coughs> of the General Laws as amended that Wagner Hospitality Management, LLC, doing business at Holiday Inn Falmouth, has applied for a transfer of an all-alcoholic beverages hotel license located at 291 Jones Road, Falmouth, Mass. A hearing will be held in the Selectman's Meeting Room, Falmouth Town Hall, on Monday, October 3, 2022, at 7.15 on the above application. Per order of the Select Board, publication date Friday, September 23, 2022, Falmouth Enterprise. Okay, do we have someone here to represent the applicant? Welcome. Hi I'm Wagner Quintanilla from Wagner Hospitality Management. And we recently acquired the Friday in Falmouth. And I would like to request a transfer of the current liquor license. We operate under the same circumstance, same staff, same local, same uh, hours. I just wanted to transfer ownership. Transfer. Any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Brown. I have a question about yes, the sir. application itself, but just that I noticed that there's a misspelling on the page, the front page. It says uh, license, sorry, certification. The name of license is Wagner, spelled W A G N E R. And the manager is listed as W A G E N R. Just a typographical error. I just want to correct that. Is the correct spelling W A G N E R? Yes, sir. That's right. Okay. What page is that, Doug? It's on the front page right here under, front under front manager. It, it's, they, just, they, they just switched two letters. I don't think we can just correct that spelling. Yep, I agree. Any other questions from the board? Concerns? Uh, no, I made the visit. Well, okay, we close I, mean, the hearing. I need oh, to I ask, first I need to ask yeah. if there's anyone here to make public comment regarding this license. And I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So move. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for approval. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for coming Thank in. you. Thank you. Okay, is Rob Munier here? There he is. Great. We're, I, the only reason I asked is because we're a little ahead of schedule, but come on up. <clears throat> and we have slated you for 15 minutes. And now the question is, does anybody know how to work that computer <laughs> to bring up his present? Um, do you have a, the, the slide deck that we sent over? Um, <coughs> I think... It's probably on that hard drive. Thanks. I uh, appreciate that. My, I'm Rob Munir. I'm the Vice President uh, for Marine Facilities and Operations at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, and my thank you for the agenda time. Uh, the topic tonight is Resilient Woods Hole, which is an initiative of HUI, MBL, uh, and the National Marine Fisheries, uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center, to uh, develop solutions for in response to the impacts of climate change. I'm here with some colleagues, Paul Spear. Uh, Chief Operating Officer at MBL, Joe Family, uh, Senior Scientist at the Woods Hole Group, Nathan Keith, representing uh, Northeast Fisheries, uh, Operations Coordinator, and Leslie Ann McGee, who's the Program Manager for this program. 
Before I leave this slide, just that little uh, outline shows kind of the area of uh, under the, that's, uh, that we cover in our, in our initiative. So this the Woods Hole area, including the uh, Gansett neighborhood down to Penzance Point, Woods Hole proper, and around up to Fay Road. So all of the areas that have potential uh, impacts from sea level rise in, in that uh, outline. So uh, th this slide has sort of two messages. One is that it's really vital that uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic, MBL, and Fisheries be where we are. Our, our job is to uh, do oceanography and marine science and ocean engineering, and we do that by having access to the sea. So it's pretty clear that our, our, we're there for a very uh, uh, distinct purpose. The other obvious thing from this slide is that we are certainly vulnerable to sea level rise. And, uh, and this vulnerability, uh, we each have our own institutional facilities, and you can see them labeled there. Uh, but these, uh, these vulnerabilities really require us to not act in isolation, but to act as a partner, as a partnership group, in order to try to come up with solutions that are not just good for our institutions, but uh, community-wide. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is develop this program and, and train the community, uh, both the businesses and the, the residents in our neighborhood, in addition to the three institutions, as well as working with the town in order to develop solutions uh, for sea level rise. To demonstrate this, we've established a steering committee, and it has all of these uh, groups that, of members, uh, including uh, the town of Falmouth, which we've really appreciated the support we've gotten from a conservation agent, from a wastewater, from the planning, and from the town <coughs> manager's office. So the motivation for tonight's meeting is that we've just finished the third phase of, of this effort. Uh, it was funded through uh, the Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management, uh, and we want to present some preliminary results. Um, we also uh, have uh, recently been awarded by CZM the follow-on uh, phase, uh, and we're in the process of signing that contract, and we wanted to let you know that, and we wanted to give you an idea of what, what it is we're trying to do. And this, last, this most current phase that's just starting to be funded actually has, we're going from planning to doing, and we're actually doing some projects that uh, will help to uh, mitigate the sea level rise issue and also act as demonstrations uh, that we can, uh, you know, continue to build on. So this is uh, going back, I'm going to go back to my picture here. This is like Mecca for ocean research. Uh, it's vital to the community, uh, but Woods Hole is also an incredibly vibrant place. And so we need to have integrated solutions. And that's really what the ultimate goal is. And we really need the town to continue to be our partner in this because you know, we can't operate even the three institutions without having the town uh, as a part of this process because of the infrastructure that you have there. So what I'd like to do is uh, we're going to turn it over to Leslie Ann McGee, who's going to provide uh, a little bit of the details of uh, the first three phases, in particular phase three with that we just finished, we finished the final report. We provided the final report in your packet. Uh, the other two reports from phases one and two are on our website, resilientwoodshold.org. Uh, but before I introduce Leslie Ann, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Paul Spear to make uh, a comment or two about the perspective of MBL. Well, thanks very much for your time. As you said, I'm Paul Spear. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the MBL. And I think, you know, this is very critical to the MBL for all the reasons that Rob just talked about. But I'd like to say one other thing for us is our campus there, as you know, sprawls sort of from Waterfront Park back through into the community and into Stony Beach. So we really are within the community, and we understand that as we work to put together a resilient campus for the long term for MBL, because we're not going anywhere we can't, it's where we are, we, we are extremely mindful of the importance of working with the local community, particularly the homeowners and the local businesses on whom we rely. And I think, you know, just from where we sit there, we recognize our, our importance in working with our, with our friends. And in fact, one of the projects that's coming up in the, uh, that we're going to talk about in this next phase really has to do with MBL property and doing some looks at how we might be able to mitigate flood, an important flood pathway back into the village uh, by our own efforts. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that we see ourselves as a critical member of the Woods Hole community. And it's very important for us to work with the community, with the town, and with the local businesses to make sure that this all works together for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Again, as Rob said, uh, my name is Leslie Ann McGee, and I'm the program manager for Resilient Woods Hole. 
Um, we took on this effort about three years ago now, um, where the three institutions really started to look at our own assets and realize that we were very vulnerable. And we brought in uh, our esteemed analytical colleague here, Woods Whole Group, with Joe Family. They've been a fantastic partner, probably no stranger to you all who have done some work on Surf Drive and other areas. And they're also well regarded in the Commonwealth um, as a leading climate science and climate adaptation um, resource. And so we're lucky to have them. And let's see, yeah, does this work? Let's see, I just do that. This is a strange platform. Okay, there we go. Um, as Rob said, um, we did decide that it was important that we not do this in isolation. We have a steering committee that is very active. They have met uh, four or five times over the last year as part of our last grant cycle with uh, the Coastal Resiliency Grant. Um, and uh, these just aren't names on a slide. These are actually active participants in our process. They review our materials, they participate in our symposium, and they give us great ideas about what's affecting them and how we can, as a larger initiative, uh, impact their life and their business um, and their livelihoods through our work. Um, we have the Woods Hole Community Association, which we're very proud of to work with. We are very integrated to them, as well as liaison from the different community neighborhoods and the business community, which is vital. We play this vital role, as we all saw during COVID, the relationship between the institutions and the business community uh, in terms of supporting each other. And that's key when we talk about large uh, impacts that we can't um, avoid. This is uh, the NOAA tide gauge, which sits on the Woods Hole Oceanographic Dock. It is one of the longest time series data we have in the region. It's very unique to have a tide gauge on um, it, such localized on our facility. Um, and thanks to our partnership with NOAA, um, we have been able to track sea level rise um, for a long time, back since the 30s. Uh, it's usually that you have a tide gauge miles away or you know, very far away from your site. We have one on our site, so we get very, very localized data, which makes our solutions very specific and customized to our needs in the village. But it is no solution, uh, no surprise to anybody that sea level uh, is rising and um, we can't avoid it. And so we're going to um, get beyond sort of what we call admiring the problem. Um, we have an imposed, uh, impending issue here. This is some of the modeling that Woods Hole Group has done. This is not necessarily- Could I ask you- Sure. I noticed that your scale is in meters. Could you tell us what that range is in inches or feet? For the relative sea level rise that we've seen? In, over that now almost 100 year period? Um, let's see, can I do the quick conversion? Uh, 2.95 meters. Just less than a foot. Just less than a foot. Yeah. Over the past. No, but that, I, I don't think people necessarily can convert that into yes. our normal units. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that because uh, as uh, scientific organizations, once we go underwater, we, we talk about meters. So <laughs> I appreciate the correction there. That's not a correction. <laughs> it's, it's communication. It's translation. It's a communication oh. issue. <laughs> um, so Woods Hole Group has done a lot of analytical work for us. This is a doom and gloom situation of 2070 and where some of the flood pathways where we could see water moving in. Um, but we need to get beyond admiring the problem. Um, we've an, analyzed the problem to death and we realize that it's time to actually start working on it. So in phase one, which was three years ago now, which we, we reported on in October 2020, right at the height of the pandemic, um, Woods Hole Group helped us do vulnerability assessments for our individual institutional properties, looking specifically at all of our assets um, and how they were potentially going to be impacted. When we look at risk, we look at um, the potential for impact plus the consequence of that impact, meaning so if you flooded something that wasn't as important to you, it wouldn't, might knock out your power. It might be a flood risk, but it wouldn't necessarily be an institutional risk. So we looked at the sort of consequence um, of flooding. And we did see that our high tide flooding impacts will impact 37 assets on our sites. And we do expect extreme storm impacts to uh, impact nearly all of our all of our 118 assets by 2070. So 2070 seems like a far off, but uh, in sort of climate science, it's really not that far off. Uh, and if we all wanna be around in 2070 and have this wonderful community still thriving, we need to deal with that. Um, we also looked at our salt marshes. Uh, they may um, expand in the near term doing the analytical work, but they will probably be drowned out in, in the long term. Um, and they provide a number of ecosystem services for um, our areas, as also they do, uh, do some, provide some flood capabilities for us. And we looked at adaptation concepts for our assets on our own institutional campuses. And at the end of that, we provided a symposium to the public that really talked about climate science 
our evaluations of our own institutional assets and then what we were going to do in the future. So we were really looking sort of myopically at our own institutions and we decided based on the output of that that it, we needed to in phase two start thinking about what was happening in our community um, because as Rob and Paul said anything we do to our institutions we need to do it in partnership with our community and we also felt we need to lead by example by analyzing the, part, the um, assets in the community around us and not just our own assets. So we did expand our study area as um, Rob showed you our study area we expanded it east west to Nobska and Penzance and then north to Quisset um, because we felt that that was really what defined Woods Hole as a village and we expanded our vulnerability assessments to include roads and residential commercial buildings so not just our own properties but what was happening to the properties around us and we did find that by 2070 in a one percent storm surge which by the way we just saw what happened to Fort Myers um, we could flood about 5.5 miles of roadway in our area and 362 buildings in Woods Hole would be impacted by that kind of storm. That's pretty substantial to our small community. And we also mapped a key flood pathway specifically at Stony Beach, which is part of our next phase, um, and also in Gardner <coughs> Road. And so then we started looking at our own assets and starting to refine our own adaptations and we presented another symposium at the end of that to, to show the community what we had learned from that analysis. Phase three, which we just finished in June, which was funded by the first two studies, I should say, were self-funded by the institutions. They um, pulled their own money to support the phase one and phase two. And we decided when we wanted to formally involve the community and become a recognized project, we applied to the state and got some coastal zone management, coastal resiliency grant funding. And that was really helpful for us. We held a community vulnerability workshop. We assessed um, the vulnerability of the community. We showed them where we saw vulnerable spots. We asked them to provide us input on where they saw vulnerable spots. We had them supply us with pictures of flooding that they had, experiences they had, the sort of citizen science that we sort of involved in our process. Um, we did a stakeholder survey to understand what the stakeholders really wanted to see. Did they want to retreat? Did they want to live with water? Did they want to become more resilient? Did they approve? Did they want to see us do hard structures? Did they want to see us do a green sort of natural approach? And so we asked them generally what they thought uh, we should be approaching this with. And one of the re remarkable answers from that is the response was doing nothing is not an option. I think the community recognizes that they have to start adapting um, and they wanted to work with us um, to do that. We then took that information and developed a uh, neighborhood level phased and flex flexible plans for all nine neighborhoods in Woods Hole Village with the help of Woods Hole Group. So essentially we went out and showed them over the next, you know, between now and 2070, what are the types of adaptations that they could choose to do in their neighborhood and how long would they be good for, meaning how long would, you know, using a green approach be in their neighborhood versus at some point having to do more hardened approach. We didn't end up deciding um, any type of preferred pathway for adaptation for them. We just sort of talked to them about the types of adaptations and developed ones for each nine neighborhoods. Our next phase, we're actually going to go back specifically to the neighborhoods and say, here is the four kind of sort of plans you could do. What would be preferable to you? And then we had an adaptation workshop uh, in May. Uh, which we had an integrated workshop where lots of folks in the community came and put post-it notes on walls and sort of told us what they were thinking and what their neighborhood they could see happening in they, their neighborhood, which was really interesting. We also launched Resilient Woods Hole website. So if anybody wants to check out the website, it's resilientwoodshole.org. All of the reports are there. There's also a story map there that sort of shows you some of the impacts over time. It's very impressive. Woods Hole Group developed that for us as well. They are a gem in this community. If anybody doesn't know, we're really pleased with their work. So please check out that website. So that all wrapped up in June and we just released our phase three report. It is on the website. Uh, we did provide you uh, with a copy of that report. And we also provided you with another key piece of information is that CZM funded us to do a regulatory review, essentially to look at um, and identify what are the regulatory impediments to coastal resilient development. We talk about being coastal resilient, but you know, it's not exactly that easy in our current regulatory environment. And they asked them to outline ways in which existing regulations, bylaws, and ordinances, for example, can be modified to allow for and encourage climate adaptation projects. You'd be surprised in the sense that we've developed a whole host of regulatory regime in all of our towns, um, but they don't necessarily consider um, how it, what's necessary to become climate resilient. We, uh, that study I actually emailed um, as well today. It's on, on the website. It's short. It's like maybe eight or nine pages. It does come up with local level uh, specific recommendations, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. It also does cover some state and federal level um, uh, recommendations as well. So we have recommendations for zoning bylaws, which is to streamline the permitting process. 
um, create the ability to seek a special permit relief under the floodplain overlay for resiliency projects, which is very important, amend the zoning bylaw definition of building height for buildings located in a flood zone. We're actually coming to the planning board on October 11th, and some of these regu some of these instances are coming to us with some of our site plans for redeveloping our waterfront. Um, allow for reduced setbacks either by right or by special permit. Um, create coastal resiliency consideration as part of a site plan review or special permit criteria to sort of build in, you know, at a very basic level, the concept of resiliency into local zoning bylaws. And then to take a look at the historic bylaw, we've gotten a lot of feedback from our community that they like to be climate resilient, but in some respects it becomes uh, sort of a logjam with some of the historic uh, bylaw issues that are out there for them. And then also to um, change potentially the Falmouth Wetlands Bylaw, which is uh, to develop a limited project or carve out for the sort of stricter standards, including the 25 foot V zone presumption, which means that FEMA sets a velocity zone and then the town puts a 25 foot buffer on that. And that it makes being adaptable very more difficult, I should say. So that report and all of, you know, how they sort of got to some of those conclusions is in your packet. So what's next? So we really want to demonstrate action. Now that we've done all the analytical work, we've done a lot of community outreach and engagement, we've done a lot of planning, we really want to provide a model for the Commonwealth and the country. We haven't found really a private-public partnership like this. Uh, it is somewhat unique, and we want to uh, make sure that we grow that. Again, we did get a second resiliency grant. is about just under $500,000 uh, with a $124,000 match from the institutions. That starts about now. We just had our kickoff meeting with CZM and it's going to go for about 15 months or 18 months, depending on how long it takes us. And really what we want to do is demonstrate the power of this private-public um, partnership. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do uh, things in the short, medium, and long term. So in the short term, we're going to be doing some demonstration projects on, on both um, all three campuses, HUI, MBL, and NOAA. We have some funding to sort of design and construct what we're calling no regrets um, scientific facility adaptations. What do these flood barriers look like? How do you protect a door? You know, how do you protect a vent? And so we're going through um, the evaluation on each of our sites of what is the most critical assets on our waterfront sites we have to protect. And let's test out some of these flood proofing measures that, that are out there on the marketplace. And so then we can share that uh, experience with not only our homeowners, but our other business community that is also struggling uh, with being climate resilient as well. So we'll be doing those immediately. Um, I don't know why this didn't show up, but oh, there it is. Um, so we're also going to be at the uh, good graces of MBL and their leadership. We're going to be conducting a feasibility study. Um, we're going to be looking at the dune system on Stony Beach and seeing if we can make it more resilient. Essentially, if, if it's feasible to reconstruct the dune system, take away some of the hardscape, which is the tennis courts behind it, uh, and, and actually provide flood protection for that rest of that neighborhood. You can see here in the circle where Stony Beach is, this is the 2070 flood pathway, so you can see where water is potentially going based on the current elevations that are going to be coming over Stony Beach and into the neighborhoods. And MBL has agreed uh, to do a feasibility study of that site, which will be a great demonstration project for the rest of the community. You can see sort of up here there is also a significant flood pathway. That is actually a private homeowner's uh, seawall. And so while we can't do anything about a, public, a private homeowner's seawall, I think by doing demonstration projects and feasibility studies, we can show what's possible. Um, but um, we can see that we want to stop water because we may have um, some significant impacts from that. So that's our medium-term piece of work that we're doing in this grant. And the longer-term piece is to really make our outreach and engagement more robust. So we're going to be developing working areas for the different neighborhoods, and we're going to be sitting down with the actual residents and going through their adaptation plans and talking to them in great depth about what would they like to see, make them sure they understand what's possible for them, and then get them to work together as a group of residents to determine what pathway they want to go with their adaptations. We're going to be developing and delivering climate and climate resiliency podcasts to educate and engage stakeholders, and we're going to be providing, bring, bringing in a number of resources to do that to make them available to the public. Um, we're going to use some more social technology to reach out and franchise underserved and diverse uh, residents and businesses. Um, we have a very diverse community here in the sense that we have different types of home ownership, we have different types of uh, workforce, uh, we have different types of needs for the community that we need to re recognize that it's not just those of us at the institutions, it's everybody that we rely on and everybody that relies on us and our economic throughput uh, every year. And then last, we're going to produce an accessible uh, Woods Hole Climate Walking Tour. 
Um, so it'll be a self-guided walking tour for all visitors so they can physically connect with our urgent climate resilient needs and opportunities that we have out there. There's nothing like seeing it in person. And so um, we think it's really important to actually allow folks to, uh, to see the demonstration projects, to see some of our flood pathways, and also to hear from residents and businesses on their climate uh, plans. So that's what I have for you tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions, and hopefully that didn't take too long. Questions from the board? Mr. Brown? I wonder if, um, you know, we were talking at our strategic planning meeting on Saturday, and I had mentioned that I would love to see a streamlined process for coastal projects such as yours, which would reduce the number of agencies involved. And would, I would like to see Mass DEP and CZM team up and just be the sole permitting authority for projects like this and others in like our Monant Beach project as an example, there's just too many reviews and this by the time it gets through the review, the material's outdated and it's like a you know, chasing your tail. So if you want to consider maybe partnering on that and sending a letter to the state, I think I hope this board would support that. We haven't talked about it much, so I can't say that we would, but I would hope we could talk about it again. And well, I have to say that as a former CZM director uh, in the mid-2000s, I would appreciate um, some streamlining as well. Good. And then uh, to, the, to the dune at Stony Beach, we had a resident, uh, Eddie, Eddie Senecal, who built a beach uh, barrier for Black Beach uh, Homeowners Association. And typically, snow fence on the beach in the winter is just aligned in a straight pattern. But Eddie noticed that down in uh, North Carolina, They've been using a zigzag pattern of the, the fence, and it's much more effective, so he did it. And if you go out and look at the town's standard straight fence, and then look at what he's got a little further down the beach, by go to Chappaquoy Beach and take a left, and it, it just accumulates so much sand. So that's another thing I'd like us to look into. Sure. That's it for Other me. Other questions or comments, Mr. Patterson? Well, just <coughs> along with what Doug was saying, I mean, I, it seems like all of our regulations so far have been toward environmental issues. Now, this is more protection of human resources and issues. And it, it seems like uh, the regulations so far have been oriented toward environmental protection, which I t personally favor. But now I think we need to see some kind of accommodation for you know, the human resources that we have in this town. And I hope this really reinforces the work of our uh, uh, what's it called the crack the, the uh, coastal, resiliency coastal resiliency action. action committee that took a look at the surf drive beach area i really see these as complementary and, and mutually supportive uh, quite impressed and and i know this there's work that's been done around the world uh, just on wednesday there last wednesday there was a, a nova uh, special on venice and the work that they've been doing to try to mitigate the flooding that's been occurring more frequently as a result of sea level rise and uh and try to pull in some of those mitigating kinds of measures which are hard measures but we're trying to t protect you know millions of dollars worth of assets and i just would love to see us kind of mutually work together and i know this whole group is actually working for both entities so to see if we can't come up with some approaches that everybody can buy into and said that just makes sense yes and just i'll add to your coastal resiliency advisory committee comment we our regulatory analysis actually sort of jumped off from where they ended and we took that to heart as we were looking at the regulatory review we need to take it that one next step and then the next step would be what would those new bylaws and ordinances look like um, and we're happy to continue providing models for those, as is the uh, Cape Cod Commission providing model bylaws uh, for these types of situations as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add to your uh, comment about learning from international activities. Uh, with our project, we've actually engaged the Port of Rotterdam, which has been solving, trying to solve this problem for about 500 years. Yes. And have got fantastic insights from them. Uh, and I think turning that around, uh, we would love to have this project become a model that we can export because we think this is such a unique circumstance where we have this location, we have this group of uh, institutions, and we have a real willing community to participate. Uh, the uh, workshops we've had have been really interesting and really uh, well attended with a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, to the extent you want to be enthusiastic about this problem, you have to look at it sort of dispassionately and say we're solving a problem, and, and then it becomes uh, very uh, engaging, and the, the community has been 
very receptive. So I think we have something here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rob? That was mine. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to the update on the traffic improvements at 151. <clears throat> and I would ask um, <clears throat> James McLaughlin, PW engineer. And we've slated you for 15 minutes, and I apologize, we're just a bit behind. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, James McLaughlin, town engineer. And uh, tonight we have, as we had last week, uh, John Diaz from GPI, who's our traffic engineer and consultant that has been working in Falmouth for a very long time, I think dating back to Jones Road, um, maybe even earlier than that. But uh, he's very familiar with um, our uh, projects and uh, what we have going on in the community. And there are two, two projects that we wanted to update the board on tonight. One is on Worcester Court and Spring Bowers Road, and the second is Sam Turner, um, Boxbury Hill, Loverfield, and Route 151. Both of these uh, intersections have had a number of uh, um, traffic accidents. Uh, I think you'll recall a few years ago there was a fatality at the uh, 151 location, and I believe there previously there was a, a fatality there a number of years ago. Um, and uh, the one on uh, Worcester Court has a lot of uh, a lot of accidents and a lot of near misses. Um, and uh, at Worcester Court, uh, we're proposing a relatively mild improvement. And then, as you'll see on um, Sam Turner and, and uh, Route 151, it's a much more extensive uh, program. So I'll just turn it over to John, and he can go through the, the details on both of them. Hey again, John Diaz with GPI, and back here this week. Uh, where's it? Uh, as Jim mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, two intersections or tonight, or two projects. Uh, the first is the Worcester Court at Spring Bars Road. Um, as Jim mentioned, this is a fairly straightforward um, project. Uh, there was, as Jim mentioned, high accidents out there. They, there was an RSA done, uh, road safety audit done several years ago. Uh, and we're just proposing to install a flashing beacon with yellow, <coughs> uh, flashing yellow warning lights on facing uh, Worcester Court and flashing red on Spring Bars Road to reinforce the stop condition. Um, again, <laughs> nothing, nothing glamorous about it, pretty straightforward. So unless there's any questions on that one, we'll just go on to Sam Turner, which is, which is a, a much big, bigger project. I, I would just make a quick observation. It seems when I travel through that intersection, people that are traveling on Worcester Court I mean, I think the Spring Bars Road people expect the Worcester Court people to stop, assuming it's a four-way stop. So I think that's why there's accidents. It just looks like a four-way stop, yeah. but it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're hoping that... It never has been, though. No, it hasn't, right. but, but it just has that... But it just looks like that, yeah. so people assume right. that that's what it's going to be. So they get there first, they've stopped, mm -hmm. they see the other car coming, they think they have the right of way, but even though they don't, they don't pay attention that there's no stop sign. Yeah. Just an observation. So for the, the uh, 151 Sam Turner, um, let me just go to this one first because it's better to look at the whole intersection. Um, we've been looking at this project for a, a couple of years now, um, and we've looked at several alternatives. This is, we're on our third iteration of uh, designs for this, this project. Uh, we had looked at a roundabout out there, um, but as you can imagine with the configuration of how Cloverfield and Boxbury Hill Road come in, um, trying to get a roundabout in there, a traditional type of roundabout that works is, was, was uh, pretty extensive. Um, it required a lot of uh, land impacts outside the right-of-way, and we would have ended up with, uh, we have a concept of it, it's a, like a peanut-shaped roundabout. And it was just, uh, it just really didn't work. It was a, a pretty significant cost difference. Um, we then went to, back to looking at a signal. Um, this is the second iteration of the signal. We, the first iteration had, um, had an additional uh, lane um, along this approach. Uh, but again, w that started to get into some right-of-way impacts once you chase that alignment down. So we're, we're at this, this, uh, this approach here. Um, the bulk of it fits within the, the right of way. There is some some minor takings on the on the corner here where the, the right of way is a 
pointed triangle, obviously we need to, to make that a rounded area. So, some minor impacts along Boxbury Hill Road in this area. But the, the bulk of the project, as you can see, is, is within the right of way. So it's, um, it's, um, it, it works well out there. So it starts down, it's, it is a fairly long project by the time we chase down the, the turn lanes and transitions. Uh, but as you can see, we transition as you're, as you're heading, um, I guess it's east mm -hmm. on, on 151. Uh, we form a, a, a dedicated left turn lane at the intersection for Cloverfield. We have a dedicated through lane and a through and right lane to access Sam Turner and, and Boxbury. Uh, the whole intersection is controlled by signals, obviously. And then we have a left turn lane for Sam Turner and Boxbury Hill uh, Road here uh, coming westbound a free right turn coming out, and then again we, we chase that down uh, to transition back in. Uh, as far as the, this is a little complicated, but as far as the, the operations of the intersection, so again we'll have signals out controlling all the approaches. Um, we will run the, the main line in a traditional left turns going, left dedicated left turns, then the throughs. Uh, we then have a, a pedestrian, safe uh, pedestrian, Phase so the, the whole intersection stops when the, the pedestrians are crossing. Uh, then Boxbury Hill will go, and then we went Sam Turner and Cloverfield uh, together. So it's a fairly complex signal, but um, it does what we need. It, it controls the, the difficult movements out of there, gives everyone the right of way through the intersection, um, and addresses uh, the we provide the, the peg crossing there. We are chasing and doing sidewalks. It's another project that the, the town is potentially looking at, but we're putting the infrastructure in at the intersection to accommodate the, the pedestrians. That was... Are they, are they like motion sensor activated or is it just strictly timed? No, they, all, the, all the signals now are, are fully actuated. So there's, um, we'll probably do video detection on this, either video detection or, or the in pavement loops. But it's it's all uh, and where this is an isolated intersection, it's it's fully adaptable to the the traffic. So that if there's nobody waiting at Boxbury or Sam Turner, yeah. you're just going to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Will there be um, a school bus pickup mandating? I know that I know that now at least at Cloverfield, the school bus stops right in that intersection. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll have to coordinate that. Yeah, we can, we can look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Great. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks for all your work. Oh, uh, I guess I do have a question. When do you think this is going to happen? We've looked at a couple of, I think this is our third year talking about it. We're not supposed to ask that question. Uh, still a few years away. Jim, the mic, please. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, in terms of the timing, it's still uh, a couple of years away. Um, the design that uh, GPI has right now is uh, somewhere a little bit beyond 25%, but uh, there's still a lot of design work, and then, uh, as, as John mentioned, also um, some right-of-way issues that we'll have to work through. So it would be several years before we're at a uh, point of construction. Is there anything this board could do to expedite it? I mean, a few years ago we were feeling like it was so urgent with the, it was not our first fatality. Correct, yeah. Um, well, uh, they're working as diligently as they can, and uh, unfortunately, it's a very complex uh, project, as John mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of issues to uh, flush out of the through the design, as one came up tonight with the uh, school bus. So, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let us know if there's anything we can do to get it going. Thank you. Who will be the next board that, or, or agency that needs to review these plans to kind of give a, a green light from them? Oh, both of these projects are, are on town town property. Yep. Uh, so it's really within the the jurisdiction of um, the town of Falmouth. Uh, okay. Funding wise, I think with Worcester Court, um, we're expecting to uh, apply for some uh, Chapter 90 funding for that. Uh, and Peter's work, Peter McCartney's working on that. So um, that, I think, would be, you know, not even requiring a town meeting approval. This project on Spring, um, on uh, Sam Turner and 151, uh, given the extent of it, uh, 
I'm sure will require um, at least some town meeting approvals uh, as we go forward, for, certainly for the uh, um, land takings uh, as well as some of the uh, construction funding. Obviously, we're going to try and get uh, whatever grant money is available, but uh, this will be a, a very substantial uh, cost to the town. So we'll be trying to engineer that as best we can also. Will this be phased with the work on the... Um, excuse me, Davis Straits and Dillingham Spring Bars Road, that intersection right in there that needs work too? Um, well, the, the um, Dillingham and Davis Straits, the, those projects um, will be TIP projects, yep. and they will end up being, uh, in terms of timing, way out uh, five plus years. Um, huh. As far as uh, right now, uh, where we are with the, the TIP process and, and um, uh, Mass DOT is we're still working through getting a, a design that's acceptable to the state. Once we get to that point, um, then they'll put us on the TIP at the far end. Right now, they're programmed all the way through for the next five years. So it'll be six, seven, eight years before we're actually at a point of having funding for those uh, those aspects of it, whereas the um, uh, spring bars and Worcester Court, we can, you know, hopefully move forward in the next year or so. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on in business to town manager hiring process, and I will turn that over to Attorney O'Keefe, town council. So I just wanted to provide some additional clarifying remarks following my presentation last Monday. And um, there are two points that I wanted to start with. One is that um, I expressed some reservations about the use of the RFP process. I wasn't quite sure if it was allowable in the, in the circumstances here. And I know that the financial team here um, in Town Hall also expressed uh, even more reservations about the use. And so uh, we actually reached out to the IG's office and they take the position that under these facts where the estimated cost is under $50,000 that an RFP process is not available. So we're just gonna take that off the board. See, already it's getting a lot easier. <laughs> so now what you have before us is um, there are just the two processes, and I have a memo, and then I also made this nice little flowchart for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank With you. the bullet points, color-coded. Um, and so what we have are the two choices, either the solic solicitation of at least three quotes or sealed bids through an IFP process. And to be quite candid, I really believe that the solicitation of three quotes is the appropriate way to go here for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, the, there's really uh, just a handful of companies out there who do this. We know the universe of people who are going to look to um, try to get this contract. We know who they are. They're known quantities. It would, it, it's a very easy pathway forward in those circumstances to just reach out to the companies. And um, I, I'll work with um, Melanie, Melanie in the finance department to make sure that we know everyone, but I think that we do. And just send them a, a solicitation for a quote and have them return it. It is the quickest, most efficient way to get this bus rolling. If, you, uh, if we do use the IFB process, it's um, more regimented, uh, it's just more involved. It doesn't give you any more leeway as far as your choice because you still are tied to the lowest bidder that meets the qualifications. Um, but it's just, it would probably lengthen the amount of time that it would, it would take to um, have a consultant sign a contract by about three times, I would guess. So whereas, if we really move quickly, we could probably have someone get going on this in the next month. With the IFB process, we're talking three months before we even get someone working on this. Um, so that's where we are. I did just want to provide those two points of clarity here. 
And I do highly suggest that um, the town go ahead and, and just go ahead and start um, soliciting quotes for the consultant. Uh, could I just get clarification, please? So you're saying the center column the solicitation of at least three quotes, which is what you let off with, right? And then further on down in that same column, it's the IFB must contain scope of service. So are those separate items in that same column? I'm not quite understanding what you're... Sure, and I'm happy to explain that. So under section 4A of chapter 30B, that's the section that talks about solicitation of quotes. At the end of section 4A, where it says you have to solicit three, three quotes, uh, at least three quotes, there's a sentence that says, oh, if you want, you can use sealed bids. So um, that's an amendment to the law from 2016. Um, it is a pathway forward, but it's not always the best process, especially here where you have a known quantity of, of possible consultants out there. Okay, so all the things that are listed in the center column are not necessarily included in what you're recommending. Is that correct? So in the sec sec center column, you'll ha you see it says solicitation of three quotes, and then there are three bullet points underneath. Those all talk about the process for solicitation of quotes. And then there's the sealed bids underlined, and the three bullet points underneath sealed bids are, are characteristics of the sealed bid process. I see, so the top half of it could be addressed separately, or we could take it to the next level and go with the sealed bids, is that what you're saying? You have two choices. You can do okay. one or the other. One or the other. I see, they're not all inclusive on they're that. They're not all inclusive. Okay. Well, they overlap, but they're... So okay. I, I would move that we, we go with the recommendation of town council to use the solicitation of three, at least three quotes in this process. Second. Without the sealed bid process. Right, right. they're separate. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I ask a question though? Yes. I mean, it seems to me there's been a lot of other municipalities that have been through this. Probably we have been through it before. So it seems we should have, uh, you know, the scope of work pretty much drafted out at least, and even the desired qualities of service. Absolutely. Can we get those kind of before us in, in a draft form and uh, so that we can go ahead and proceed? I'm going to go ahead and proceed. Yeah, I have all the information I need to go ahead oh. and get the, get the quotes already. Okay. And I did some homework this past weekend and sent two firms, and I'm looking for another one as suggestions for, for firms that have done this Cape-wide and, and otherwise for, for more to consider for getting okay. quotes. Great. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for clarifying and sort of boiling that all down for us. It was very helpful. Here, here. It's confusing, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so now uh, number four, business. Vote article recommendations for November 2022 annual town meeting. And if you look at Mr. Johnson's job's memo, um, we're going to take these articles. There are only five of them for which we will submit recommendations to town meetings. The first one, remove the fire department from civil service. Um, I'd like to know what the board would like to do with that. I move that we, re we recommend approval of Article 6. I'd second Mr. Patterson's motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second to remove the Falmouth Fire Department from civil service. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Okay, we have Article 11, repeal the plastic water bottle ban. Um, I, and I, I just want to just read a couple of statements from Mr. Johnson Schwab's report. And he does say, I defer to the board to assess the trade-offs of the environmental benefits versus customer convenience. I'd like to move that we recommend indefinite, uh, indefinite postponement to Article 11. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to indefinitely postpone Article 11 to repeal plastic water bottle ban. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Number 12, um, we were understanding that, that this would be withdrawn. However, it has not been. So uh, Mr. Johnson Staub recommends indefinite postponement of this article regardless of the board's position on Article number 11. So moved. Second. 
Okay, so we have a motion and a second to indefinitely postpone Article 11 to repeal plastic water bottle ban. All those in that, favor? Is that Article 12? That's Article 12. Article, did I say 11? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, shit. It's 11. They're so similar. Okay, all 12. those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Article 12. Right. Article 12. Thank you. To indefinitely postpone Article 12, repeal plastic water bottle ban. Okay, Article 13, adopt bylaw for disposal of surplus firearms. Um, approval of this article would result in foregone revenue. The town received a trade-in credit of $11,175 with 21 rifles traded into the vendor this year. I defer to the board to weigh the financial impact of the article against the safety argument put forth by advocates for this article. I have a question, and perhaps Attorney O'Keefe can answer this one. Um, if we were to pass this article, well, I should say the town meeting were to, but does this apply to all future um, trade-ins of, of automatic rifles? Yes. Okay. So it, it's in reading Peter's comment, it, it sort of suggested it would only apply to those weapons that have just recently been tr turned in. But no, but you've answered my question, and I think that's the intent of the petitioners. So. I would move approval that we recommend approval of Article 13. Excuse me a second. It's up for up for discussion. Um, the town doesn't own any automatic weapons. Number one, we keep we keep referring to them as automatic. They, they, they're not. Okay. They're semi-automatic weapons. Well, I'm in support. Well, personally, I'm in support of this because so we, we need to characterize it for what it is. I mean, it's not an automatic weapon. We don't own any. And I also have a question about clarification because it says high capacity firearms. Does that include uh, pistols that are semi automatic with high capacity clips, maybe 18 rounds? Because I believe that our police officers commonly buy those back at the end of their career. Is that the sidearm? It is. That and doesn't, I don't I don't think that's the intent, but I wonder if the language could be problematic for that practice. So the bylaw, proposed bylaw talks about assault weapons, and, and that goes to um, Black Board Member Zelensky's comment. Not, they're not uh, automatic weapons, they're assault weapons. And they are specifically defined through state statute here by the assault weapon um, ban language at section 128 and also at section 131M. Those are not pistols and please I'll ask well, it you says, to but it also but it also says that assault weapons and other high capacity firearms that are banned under the general laws of the Commonwealth and I'm not familiar with all the laws about firearms but I just wonder if that could accidentally include large magazine semi-automatic pistols that's what makes them large capacity is the magazine is right. the feeding yeah. a apparatus just a minute hold on I where, I'm sorry, where are you, where are you looking? Uh, it says uh, preventing, I'll read the whole thing. The purpose and intent of this bylaw is to take action to prevent injury to the people of Falmouth and beyond by preventing assault weapons owned by the town of Falmouth from re-entering the stream of commerce. This bylaw acknowledges that assault weapons and other high capacity firearms that are banned under the general laws of the Commonwealth are capable of causing great harm. When it says other high capacity firearms, I'm just curious what that leads us to. So it, that, it's specifically, it's not, it's not high capacity firearms. It's high capacity firearms that are banned yeah. under the general laws. So right. they're qualified there. Yeah. So it's not sidearms that are, that are typically yeah. carried by our, our police personnel. Okay. This, this the, my reading of this is that the only weapons that are subject to this bylaw are ones that would be otherwise banned under the general laws so That's, that your regular person with a, a license to carry would not be able to purchase it regularly okay i think that's under definitions that's pretty clearly specified yeah okay it says other banned okay do we have it has to be okay excluded by that particular ordinance or law okay then. okay do we have a motion and a second i move and what is the motion i move approval of article 13. Recommendation? A recommendation a rec to adopt the bylaw. Yes, I'm, 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 we are recommended Article 13. Okay, so we have a motion. Second. And a second. 
Motion and a second, Article 13, to approve or to recommend adoption of the bylaw for the diso disposal of surplus firearms. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. <clears throat> Article 14. Adopt a bylaw regulating single-use black plastic containers. Um, the recommendation from Mr. Johnson Staub, the board may want to consider recommending indefinite postponement to allow the article sponsors and the Board of Health time to engage business owners in a dialogue about the implications and costs that this bylaw would present for small businesses. Madam Chair, I'd just like to make note that I did ask Michael Kasparian if he had spoken to any of his members about this. And I don't think there was any outreach to them, so they weren't quite aware of it yet. So I would uh, move indefinite postponement. Okay, so we have a motion to indefinitely postpone Article 14, adopt bylaw regulating single-use single, single use black plastic containers. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Mr. Lewis, second. second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Can I, can I make a comment on yes. that? Yes. Um, I would like to say that I think there are other options that I would like to see us use, since the presentation did say that these black ones currently can't be recycled. But the reason I asked the... Um, the supporter of the article, if he had spoken to the business community, is because I think that's a really important piece of this. And so I think with some outreach and the business community understanding that they have an opportunity to find something else and that there is a reasonable amount of time, I would would, would like to support this in the future. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it almost goes back to the styrofoam cups, yeah. that could, situation. Go ahead, Mr. Mention, I, I actually have one of those black containers. I looked on the bottom to see what the recycling code was. And it's a three, which is one of those things they say you shouldn't be recycling when in the recycling stream. So mm -hmm. it actually might be covered there, but we need vendors to stop using those kinds of containers. But let's indefinite postpone it, work this out so we have a clear path forward. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we will move on. We do not have a town manager supplemental report, so we will move to select board reports. I will report that I attended the um, Martha's Vineyard uh, Deepship Authority Long Range Planning Task Force meeting this past week to review the fact that there were no uh, responses to the RFP for New Bedford service. And I uh, suggested, as I have in the past, that we consider sending a letter to our legislators requesting consideration of developing a subsidy for the Steamship Authority to, for one, develop a port in New Bedford, perhaps build it by a ship to serve that port, and also potentially subsidize the service for the first five years of operation or sometime, sometime yet to be determined. And uh, I will say that it was a really good discussion, and I think that the Steamship Authority uh, representatives were somewhat interested in the subsidy idea, whereas in the past, I think they've been a little reluctant to consider that because I know they've always paid their own way with the box, you know, the fare box paying the whole cost <laughs> of the Steamship Authority. But I think that there may be a realization now that costs are really spiraling out of control. They're breaching their debt ceiling. They are buying two new boats, but they were supposed to buy four, and so they're having to scale back. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> We talked about the fact that the uh, Seattle-based uh, Washington State ferry system is commonly held up as a, uh, an example of what the Steamship Authority might want to consider. For instance, electrification of their boats and uh, a lot of their infrastructure. It's often referred to when consultants do studies of the Steamship Authority. They refer to, for instance, Washington State does this. But Washington State the ferry system is a part of the highway system. So it's sub subsidized at approximately 60%. It used to be subsidized at almost 90% when it was beginning to be developed as a uh, state infrastructure uh, tool. And so now they're at 60. And uh, as I pointed out to Mr. Uh, Sayers and uh, Steamship Ma Manager, Bob, um, his last name slipped my mind right now, Bob Davis, that we're paying 100% of the cost, the vineyard people are paying 100% of the cost, whereas they're only paying 40% over there. So I think there's a real uh, interest 
in pursuing that on the part of the Steamship Authority management. I will say that the vineyard folks were pretty quiet during the discussion, so I think they're maybe a little leery of the whole idea of opening <coughs> up, potentially opening up the Enabling <coughs> Act, because I guess if we're going to start subsidizing them, that may lead to that discussion. So I will say vineyard folks are very cautious about this whole <coughs> system, and I'm <coughs> not surprised, and I don't blame them at all, because it's it is their lifeline to their island, so we're just trying to, to their some, life. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I'm always very respectful of their position, but it was an interesting conversation. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Yeah. Mr. Patterson. I have nothing to, to report today. Really? Okay. Oh. No. No, you don't want to hear I'm about sorry. my. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. You don't want to hear about my that. personal life, but <laughs> <laughs> except that you got a little peek. We did. <laughs> um, the only thing I have is there's the Martha's Vineyard Coastal Conference coming up on October 24th. I did email the organizers to ask if it would be relevant for Falmouth, given that it's about coastal resiliency and climate change, and they said that most of it is going to be specific to Martha's Vineyard, but some represent representation from the state and the Cape and a full agenda will be released shortly. And so if, if it looks like that may be of interest to us, I'll probably just um, send a one-way share to the board of people who you might be interested in attending. And that's all. Great, thank you. Thank you. We sat. No, ma'am. Uh, discussion of future agenda items? We got enough on our plate right now, don't we? I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then well, I will entertain. Oh, Mr. Patterson. You know, you know this, Coastal resiliency issue is one that's got to come up sometime in the future, not necessarily for this next meeting, but uh, we had recommendations from the Coastal Re Resiliency Action Committee. I really think we need to be taking it seriously and especially try to pair it up with the efforts of the Woods Hole community um, because it's going to take state legislation as well to get through some of these things. And if we go in together and say, look, we've got these <coughs> vulnerable places in this town <coughs> We need some action, and you know the evidence is pretty clear. You know, 12 inches of additional sea level rise just in the last 90 years. I th I think we've got to begin to push at the state level in a kind of a unified front. And of course, there are other municipalities here on Cape Cod that are facing the same issues. Um, and these are not broad scale modifications across the entire Cape. We're basically citing these various community vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. And, uh, and so I, I, but I just would like to see us be, keep, keep pushing on that because it is critical to, it's like affordable housing, it's critical to the vitality of our communities and it's coming, you know, and I, I the naysayers can say what they want, but you know, when you have a tide gauge right here in Woods Hole and it's measuring a foot of change in the last 90 years, that's extremely strong evidence. Right. I agree. We did agree that that would be coming up soon, right? Yes. Anything else for future agenda items? Okay, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I don't have anybody to do more supers to tonight. <coughs>